Okay, polysaccharides, that's where you have a whole bunch of sugars together. Poly means many, saccharides refers to sugars. Now, you can put polysaccharides into two major categories. The first one is what we call the simple polysaccharides. And the simple polysaccharides are made exclusively of one type of sugar. In fact, many of these simple polysaccharides are made of glucose, which of course is widely produced during photosynthesis. So that's the simple polysaccharides. But then there's another family, the complex polysaccharides. Complex polysaccharides are made of many different types of sugars. They may also include amino sugars as well. Okay, complex polysaccharides in addition are often highly branched like a tree. And their roles are going to be different from the roles of the simple polysaccharides. So we're going to look at the simple polysaccharides first and then move on to the complex polysaccharides. And there's several major, there's about three or four major kinds of simple polysaccharides. Three of them are made exclusively of glucose, but their properties and sometimes their functions are different because the types of covalent bonds joining the sugars together. Even though they're all made of glucose, they're noticeably different from each other. So let's take a look at some common glucose polysaccharides. One of the ones we're probably most familiar with is called starch. Starch is made by plants. And plants store starch in their stems, sometimes in their roots. A lot of their seeds are loaded up with starch and so on. Now, what's starch used for by the plant? It's an energy source. It's a compact source of metabolic energy. You store the starch, and then when you need some energy, enzymes break the starch down back into the glucose, and then you metabolize the glucose. So, starch is used for energy storage in plants. Now, of course, we obviously take advantage of that. Because a lot the majority of our foodstuffs, whether it happens to be directly to us or indirectly by using it as animal feed, is, consists of starch. Most of the seeds of the cereal grains, whether it's rice or corn or wheat or uh, barley or what have you, most of those cereal grains, you're eating the seeds, the seeds are rich in starch. Potatoes. Anybody here of Irish ancestry? Nobody? It's unusual down here. Okay, well, for quite a while, even though potatoes were actually native to South America, <coughs> they were imported to Europe, but they happened to grow very well in Ireland, which happens to have a cold, wet climate. Sounds kind of familiar, right? Uh, happens to have a cold, wet climate, fairly poor quality soil, and it grew very well, so quickly, potatoes quickly became a staple crop in Ireland. It also was used for export stuff. But then, back in the 1800s, you had that fungus that wiped out much of the potato crop, led to mass starvation of Irish people, that coupled with British policies and stuff that made a bad situation even worse. And when it was over, many of the survivors, by the millions, 
left Ireland and moved to the United States. They have areas with very high Irish populations like Boston and things like that. So a lot of people moved to the United States after that big potato famine. It's one that illustrates the risk of relying almost entirely on a single staple crop. If that crop fails, you're in serious trouble. So at any rate, but what, potato tubers are loaded up with starch. So they're a good source of energy, and not only that, they can grow in some pretty lousy soil, pretty lousy climates. You can still grow them pretty well. Okay, so that's, we eat a lot of starch, directly or indirectly. Of course, most animal feed is based on some kinds of cereal grains, the starchy, rich cereal grains, and that helps the animals to fatten up quicker than feeding on grasses, which is what they're normally supposed to do. Okay, so it's energy storage in the plant. Now, organisms store starch and the animal equivalent. We're going to see that in a minute. What they have, they produce these things in what's called the endoplasmic reticulum. More on that later. It's joints. It has enzymes that join glucose molecules together to make starch, or the animal equivalent, which we call glycogen. And then... It's released, it goes to another thing called the Golgi apparatus, which is the final processing center for all this. And then these things are released in the forms of membrane-bound compartments, or what we call vesicles, sort of storage compartments. And these are found in the cytoplasm of cells. Certain cells are going to have thousands of these things in, other cells will have fewer. So what we have here is a cell membrane, Now, once again, these things are inside the cell, sometimes a small number of them, sometimes thousands and thousands of them, depending on what size of cells you're dealing with. Inside here are thousands and thousands and thousands of starch or glycogen molecules. That's the vesicle? Yeah, a vesicle is like a membrane-bound compartment that has something in it. So this is a storage compartment. Picture a vesicle is like a cell membrane bottle. Okay, so we have these bottles filled with starch or with glycogen, and there's other things that have other contents in it. Okay, now what happens is when the cell gets hungry, in other words, running low on energy, it sends chemical signals to proteins in these membranes that activate enzymes that chew the starch up. Here's an enzyme. It breaks the starch up into glucose and then pumps the glucose out into the cell, and it can be metabolized. So these energy storage vesicles, these starch vesicles and things like that, those are used as on-demand storage of metabolic energy. Now that's one reason why seeds are loaded up with starch for the most part. Because you have your seed, you've got a little embryonic plant in there. Problem is, and what do plants do? They photosynthesize. Problem is, it's really hard to photosynthesize if you're buried under a lot of dirt, right? So when that plant germinates, it can't photosynthesize until it actually grows enough to poke its little embryonic leaves out of the ground and actually start photosynthesis. In order to survive and grow, they need an on-site energy source, and that's what you find in the seeds. Seeds are rich in starch, some of them are fairly rich in sugar, like corn kernels, as well as so corn kernels. Those are the seeds of corn plant. What are they loaded up with? They have lots of sugar, corn sugar or glucose. They have lots of starch. And then they have lots of lipids, corn oil. And that's typical of seeds, having lots of polysaccharides and lots of lipids to serve as an energy source that will power the growth and development of these early plant embryos. And generally, just about the time they start, the seeds start running out of their food supply, uh, their energy supply, the little plant has poked its leaves up above the ground and is starting to photosynthesize. So now it can make its own sugars. Okay, so that's what we see here in terms of starch. Now, obviously, we have the enzymes that can break starch down into glucose. They're called amylases. We have amylases all over the place in our digestive tract, even in our saliva. Now, case in point, a little experiment here you can do at home. Get some cornstarch 
and put a spoonful of it in your mouth and just suck on it for a while. Or take a raw potato slice and just chew on it for a while. I know, it sounds weird. But you will notice after a period of time, it will start tasting sweet. And the reason why is the amylases in your saliva are starting to break the starch down into glucose. Starch by itself doesn't have much of a taste to it. That's why everybody's looking funny about eating a spoonful of starch, right? Okay, it doesn't have much of a taste by itself, but when it's broken down to glucose, then you start noticing a distinctly sweet taste. Hey, it's a harmless little experiment. You try that at home, right? But you'll see that. And of course, we have amylases in our digestive tract and stuff, too. Okay, now, I know, why well, I'll just do weird things. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it's harmless. It's actually good for you. Okay, now, aside from starch, animals have the equivalent of an energy storage polysaccharide, but it's not starch. It's made entirely of glucose by two different covalent bonds. They actually can form branches in there. But this molecule is called glycogen. Glyco means sugar and gen, short for generator. Literally sugar generator, sugar producer. Because, once again, it can be broken down into glucose. Glycogen is produced exclusively by animals. And once again, it too is used for energy storage. And glycogen molecules are synthesized and stored into vesicles, just like we see in starch vesicles in plants. Almost all cells have at least some of them. That's a backup reserve energy supply. Some cells are especially rich in them. And the cells that are the most packed full of glycogen vesicles are the cells of skeletal muscle. And the reason why is this. You never, when muscles are used, they burn tremendous amounts of ATP to generate muscle movement. Now, in general, a lot of times muscles aren't going to be used all that much. You know, if you're sitting back watching the football game or whatever, sitting on your couch or whatever, you're not going to be moving your muscles all that much, right? Now, on the other hand, if you're on a track and you're trying to do a 100 meter dash, you're going to be using those muscles big time. So you never know when you're going to have to use those muscles a lot. So you have to have, the muscles have to have a large supply of quick, quickly available energy. Because once in a while you're going to have to turn those muscles on full tilt and that burns ATP by the gallon. You know, it just goes through huge amounts of ATP. So muscle cells are lo loaded up with glycogen vesicles. When they're called into action, you can quickly break the glycogen down into glucose, pump it out of the vesicles, and then quickly metabolize the glucose by the process called glycolysis. And glycolysis is a very rapid process. So it generates ATP really quickly. Problem is, the breakdown products of glycolysis are acids and get rather toxic in large amounts. So after a while, if you're going full tilt on your muscles, after a while these things like lactic acid and stuff like that build up in your muscles and they start affecting their function and making the muscles hurt and things like that. And breaking those molecules down takes a lot longer. Now you eventually get more energy from it, but it takes a while. So, if you happen to be, since this JSU, right? If you happen to be a football player and you got the ball in your hand, there's about three or four 350 pound guys that want to bury your face into the ground, and there is the goalpost that way. You run like the wind. You run as fast as you can. You are relying mostly on this, what we call anaerobic metabolism, the breaking down of glucose by glycolysis. It's quick, and you may be able to do that may be able to run at 10 meters a second or so if you're a fairly good athlete. No, I can't do that, but a good athlete can. Okay, so you can do that. Now, you cannot sustain that pace. If a person could sustain a pace like that, oh, let's say crude calculation here, back in the envelope cal calculation, a good athlete could do 100 meters in 10 seconds. If you can sustain that pace, you can do a 1K run in 100 seconds, a little more than minimum, 
minute and a half. Nobody has ever come anywhere close to that. If you do a marathon, that's 40 kilometers, and that, in theory, if you could keep that pace up, would be 100 seconds, I uh, would be 4,000 seconds, which is slightly more than an hour. Nobody's ever done a marathon in an hour and 20 minutes. I think what's the world record? About two and a half hours for a marathon. And then you end up getting blown up at the end of it. We're <laughs> out now. They get crazy, crazy Chechens with uh, don't ever sell a pressure cooker to a Chechen. It's a really bad idea. Okay, but anyway, you know, those guys are notorious. Boy, they did all kinds of stuff in Russia. What yeah, Those guys are pretty bad news. But at any rate, um, you know, in all seriousness, you can't sustain those kinds of high paces. But for quick sprinting activity, you can run on glycolysis alone for brief periods. And it gives you quick energy for quick bursts. So that's what you have if you're sprinting, if you're doing like a 100 meter run, or you've got the football and you're trying to make it to the goal post before you get smashed into the ground. That type of stuff is, or if you happen to be an animal and you see your prey is pretty close by and that quick burst of rapid speed is enough to catch the prey and take it down before, before it manages to run off, that type of stuff. So muscle cells are loaded up with huge amounts of glycogen because that way they have a readily available quick supply of energy. Okay, so glycogen is the equivalent of starch in animals. Even though they're all made of glucose, the covalent bonds are different. Now, surprisingly, of course, we have the enzymes that can break glycogen down. If you didn't, why would you bother storing this stuff in the first place? Okay, but there is another glucose polysaccharide, also made by plants, that is not used as an energy source. It's used as a structural material, both at the cellular and at the organismal level. And that one is cellulose, made exclusively by plants. Now, the covalent bonds between the glucose molecules and cellulose are quite a bit different than what we've seen before. And it turns out very few organisms have the ability, have the enzymes that can actually break cellulose down into glucose. So in other words, for most organisms, cellulose is indigestible. Now what cellulose leaves for? It's a structural material because plants secrete around them a cell wall. And the cell wall is largely made of fibers of cellulose. Cellulose makes these long fibers. And then there are other things such as phenolics and lignans and stuff that will join the cellulose fibers together make things even tougher, at least in certain kinds of plant cell walls, not all. But cellulose forms a plant cell walls. And because of that, cellulose is actually a fairly tough material. Because of that, you can use as a structural material for the whole plant. Makes a point. Cellulose. Plus some lignans and a few other things in there, but mostly cellulose. Now, if you look at a tree, for instance, the living part of the tree is only the bark and a little bit beneath that. The rest of the tree, what we call the heartwood, is actually dead, non-used, uh, unused xylem from long in the past. It's no longer being used, but it's a structural material. And you can imagine, this pretty tough material. We use cellulose, specifically wood, all the time for building things. Most of our houses are basically made of cellulose. Lots of things are made out of it. And that dead cellulose, those, those cell walls from those old xylem cells, can support trees that grow to tremendous heights. I mean, the highest tree we know of right now is a redwood in California that's 372 feet high. There were some semi-reliable reports of Australian eucalyptus, the gum trees and stuff that were felled by loggers in the 1880s that topped 400 feet. I mean, I don't think that, I think the tallest building in downtown Birmingham isn't that tall. So imagine a tree, the height of the tallest building in Birmingham. Atlanta's another story, their buildings are 800 feet high. But anyway, 
And these trees could weigh tens of thousands of tons, all held up by cellulose. Cellulose has a manage is not only it's somewhat flexible, but it's still kind of on the rigid side, which is another reason why wood gets used for a lot of things. It's got some rigidity, but it's also got a little bit of flexibility in it. So, you know, you get a board or something will bend to a certain extent before it actually snap. So it's widely used, good structural material. So it's plant cell walls, and of course a great deal of plant organismal structure. Now the thing is, very few organisms have the enzymes that digest cellulose. You actually need several different kinds of enzymes to break the different types of covalent bonds you find in cellulose. And that's pretty difficult to do. So what can digest cellulose for the most part? Certain types of bacteria. Certain types of fungi have these cellulases and a few single cell eukaryotic proteins. And that's really about it. Now, on the other hand, we have animals that feed on grass, which is very rich in cellulose and very poor in everything else. How do these guys pull it off? They have, in the digestive tract, symbiotic microorganisms, especially bacteria, that do have the cellulose digesting enzymes. So it's an example of a really good combination. Another example are termites, insects. The insects themselves cannot digest wood. They can chew it up, but they can't digest it. But inside their digestive tracts are several types of cellulose digesting protists, that single cell eukaryotes, and a whole slew of different types of bacteria that also have the cellulose digesting enzymes. So it's a perfectly good arrangement, a nice symbiotic arrangement between the insect and all the nice little microorganisms living in the digestive tract. For the microorganisms, they're sitting nice and safe and protected inside a gigantic eating machine. All they have to do is sit back. They don't have to worry about things eating them because they're protected. They're inside this big, huge insect. Well, huge by their standards. And all they have to do is sit back and wait for dinner to come. Now, the insect has a good thing on this, too, because this insect can now exploit a food source that very few other organisms can. They can eat wood. All they have to do is chew it up, let the bacteria and the microorganisms break the cellulose down. The microbes take in all the, cell all the sugar they want, and the table scraps go to the termite. So, termite wins, microorganism wins, homeowner loses. And likewise, cell organisms that are grass feeders, like cattle, horses, things like that. Here again, they have, they can't digest the stuff themselves, but they do have these symbiotic bacteria in their digestive tracts and can do it. And when they develop that ability, but actually, these organisms spread a great deal around 20 or so million years ago, 20, 30 million years ago, because what happened is, uh, if you go back, say, 40 million, 50 million years ago, the global climate was much wetter and much warmer than it is nowadays. For instance, there were tropical rainforests in Germany. Germany is not exactly the thing, place you think of nowadays to go and see tropical rainforests, right? And the United States, most of the United States was tropical, subtropical, whatever. So warm, quite frequently wet and stuff. And of course, in those kind of things, there's all kinds of nice leaves and fruits and all kinds of things that support a bunch of different, wide variety of different kinds of organisms, especially mammals. Now, all of a sudden, you start getting this period, maybe about 35 million years ago or so, where the global climate suddenly rapidly got cooler and drier. So those rainforest areas shrunk. And what replaced them were grasslands. Now, then a lot of these forest-dwelling organisms simply died out or were greatly reduced in numbers. But some organisms had the ability that they could go out in these grasslands and eat the cellulose-rich grass and make a living that way. And they didn't have too much competition, so they thrived. They proliferated a huge amount at that time. Well, they start becoming, you start seeing these uh, big grasslands, what we call savannas and stuff, like you find in the Great Plains in the United States. and. Uh, Lots of, uh, lots of Africa and parts of Asia and stuff. You have these huge grasslands, a whole bunch of organisms that can feed on the grass and digest the cellulose, at least with their partners, and make a pretty good living that way. And they proliferated while a lot of these rainforest animals 
uh, shrank a lot, declined a lot, or often went extinct. So, we see that. That's a pretty big thing. Cellulose and the ability to digest it. Now, by the way, a little side here on cellulose. If you get that soft ice cream, okay, you can't lose your appetite here. It's not ice cream at all. It doesn't have a drop of milk in it. What it has is artificial color, artificial flavor, and stuff like that. And what gives it body is something called carboxymethylcellulose. It's a type of chemically modified cellulose, completely indigestible to us. What goes in comes out the other end the next morning. It's totally faced up. You can get that. I know the cafeteria here has it. Dairy Queen has that. It's completely fake. And the main thing that gives it body is actually this modified cellulose, which is completely indigestible to us. We do not have cellulose digesting symbiotic organisms in our digestive tract. So we eat something with cellulose in it, it comes out the other end pretty much un unaffected. Okay, so that's another glucose containing polysaccharide. Now, There's one other poly, simple polysaccharide I want to mention. It's not made of glucose, but it's made of an amino sugar modification of glucose. First, let's take a look at this particular amino sugar. And it's widely used in complex polysaccharides as well. It's called N-acetyl glucose amine. What you do is you start out with a glucose, six carbon sugar. And then you have a nitrogen containing group with a hydrogen off of, and then a small, what we call an acetyl group, essentially acetic acids. There it is. In for the nitrogen, glucosamine, modification of amino group, and the acetyl group here. That's an amino sugar version of glucose. It's widely used in a lot of complex polysaccharides. There are other amino sugars around, but this guy gets quite a bit of use. Now, if you make a, if you join it together a particular way, and make a polymer of it, you come up with another structural polymer. And this one is called chitin. Now, chitin has a long and interesting history. Chitin appears to have first been produced by fungi. Now, fungi came, uh, the fossil evidence and molecular evidence suggests that fungi have been around for a billion to a billion and a half years. So they've been around for a long time. They're one of the oldest of the eukaryotes that we know about. So we have fungi. Fungi live in aquatic environments, and as long as they're kept moist, many of them can live on land and stuff. They were perhaps some of the first eukaryotic organisms to colonize the land. So very first, maybe 600 million years ago, you might have started seeing mats of fungi in moist areas on land, but that would be about it. Nothing else there yet. Okay, well, fungi makes have cell walls. In fact, at one time, because they had cell walls, people thought class them as plants. They've got cell walls that are a plant. Well, no. Obviously, they cannot photosynthesize, and biochemically, genetically, they're very different from plants. As a matter of fact, they are close. It, animals were probably somewhat more closely related to fungi than plants are. So, at any rate, uh, fungi first made, started using chitin to make their cell walls. So cell walls of fungi are not made of cellulose. They make mostly of chitin. There's other things in them as well and stuff. But as perhaps our ancient fungal progenitors 
and different versions eventually develop what we might call animal type cells and you start getting animals, they didn't forget, some of them didn't forget how to make and use chitin. Because animals use chitin as well, at least some animals do. One of them that uses chitin are certain kinds of mollusks, shellfish. For instance, a gastropod, a snail, they have on their tongue-like structure, or radula, they have these ridges of chitin, so they can scrape off algae off the rocks and things like that. Or in some cases, even scrape a hole into a clam or something, and then stick their tongue in and shred the animal inside out. There are some carnivorous gastropods that literally do that. They crawl up on top of a clam and basically lick a hole in the shell and then stick their tongue in and start shredding up the animal inside and eating it. That's a nasty way to go, right? Okay, so certain kinds of mollusks have used chitin structures. Another good example are the cephalopods, octopi and squid and stuff like that. The beaks at the center of these guys are made of chitin, and they can be very sharp and very nasty indeed. They're connected to powerful muscle stuff. And for something like a large squid, say a giant squid, that beak's about this big, it could take a serious chunk out of a person if it actually bit. And many times the rings around the suckers of the tentacles also have kind of chitin-shaped ring, uh, sharp pointed rings so they can dig into the flesh when they grab onto something. Octopi don't do that, but squid do. Uh, and uh, so that's one thing. So many mollusks have used chitin, but the masters of using and producing chitin and using it are the arthropods. Because arthropods use chitin in their external shells or exoskeletons. The exoskeletons of arthropods are mostly chitin. Some of them also have mineral crystals in them, but by and large, they're mostly chitin. Now, arthropods took the ball and ran with in terms of producing and secreting chitin. Their outer skin, their epithelial layer, produces huge amounts of chitin, secretes it outside, and you get that exoskeleton. Then things like muscles are connected to different parts of it. Uh, the exoskeleton is thin in certain areas, so it can bend, so you have these different kinds of limbs and legs and, and things like that. And it's thicker in other areas. Now, an interesting thing, have you ever seen an arthropod mole? For instance, when I was a kid, I got all kinds of, like, whatever I collected from the local stream ended up in a couple of aquaria down in, uh, in the basement and stuff. And one of the things I got were a couple of crawdads. Okay, and you even find them up north. Now it's common as they're down here. But anyway, I found some, and you feed them just about anything. They eat just about anything. And one day I couldn't find one of these guys. And I'm wondering where the thing is. Something, either this partner eat it or something? Well, no, it didn't. It turned out it was moldy. It was hiding under a rock. And you could pick this thing up, and it was soft and squishy, almost like holding a large worm. Because it shedded its exoskeleton. But the next day, it grew it back so fast, by the next day when I went to pick it up, it grabbed me and drew blood. <laughs> yeah, they do have sharp claws. Okay, so, you know, when, it's, when arthropods molt, they actually can grow a significant uh, exoskeleton fairly quickly. But that was a terrific tool, both for protection and for tools for feeding and other kinds of things. Think of the claws of crabs and lobsters and crawdads and stuff like that. Think of these stingers of ants and bees and wasps. Those are all made of chitin. All kinds of different mouth parts. Some beetles have the capability where they can actually even chew through a lead pipe to try to get at something that might be good inside. And sometimes they'll like chew through uh, conduit, electrical conduits and start short circuits. Boy, talk about crispy critters. You chew through that and come in contact with two live wires. God. But, you know, these mouth parts and whatever are very, very impressive. So it gives the ability to make and secrete chitin in all kinds of different patterns, gives arthropods a tremendous amount of sort of biological tools to meet all kinds of environmental challenges, to protect themselves from predators, uh, defend themselves, to catch prey, whatever, or whatever their food source happens to be. So 
Not surprisingly, perhaps, arthropods are the most successful multicellular organisms on this planet. There are more species of arthropods, many times more than everything else put together. The total mass of ants, one of the more successful types of insect globally, exceeds the total mass of the human population. You can go out here, a single fire ant, fire ant mound out here may cover as much as an acre and contain more individual ants than there are people in this entire state. So it tells you these guys are extremely successful. Now, that came to mean the first arthropod-like creatures seem to happen in what we call the Cambrian period, about early part of Earth's history. And that's dated from about 540, 500 million years ago. At that time, there was a tremendous diversification of life, especially life that had various kinds of hard shells, hard body parts that fossilized really well. You found relatively little life prior to that, and then all of a sudden, it's all over the place. And one of them was you start seeing organisms with hard shells. There were mo primitive mollusks, there were also some distant relatives called brachiopods, which are, were very common back then and relatively rare, but still around now. And lots of arthropods and arthropod precursors and stuff. Some of these things look like stuff out of a science fiction movie, truly bizarre body plants. Most of them are very, very small, a few inches long. A couple of them got to be about this big. They were the giants of their days. But people have wondered, why all of a sudden this huge explosive proliferation of life? What caused that? And there's been all kinds of different hypotheses and stuff, ranging from more oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, but one common thing, one common hypothesis of what actually caused this is when organisms start to develop things like hard shells and stuff. There were signs of predators previous to that, especially worm-like things. Some worms are actually pretty impressive predators. There were signs of predation and predators and stuff. But if you build yourself a shell around yourself, it's like, yeah, okay, you think you can get me? I'm in a layer of armor. Oh, go, go somewhere else. Get a meal somewhere else. You ain't going to get me. So, you know, in effect, if you start developing things like protective shells, whether it's made of chitin or whether it's made of calcium carbonate like mollusks and things like that, that gives you a lot of protection from predators, especially if wormy type predators. And then you end up developing kind of like an arms race. It's like, okay, the predators say, yeah, you think you're safe? I can use chitin too, and I'm going to get do something, and I'm going to go and get you. So they would do that, and there may have been, the reason for all this proliferation of life may have at least partially been a predator-prey arms race, using these new tools, the ability to make things structures out of chitin, which is a tough, durable material, or making things out of calcium carbon. That seems to have started around then, and that may have led to a predator-prey arms race and all kinds of experimenting with different body plans, most of them which really didn't last very long. And that may have been the major spark of this animal evolution we see back here. Okay, so kind's pretty interesting. So now, uh, obviously, if you've ever tried to crack open a uh, lobster claw or crab claw or something <laughs> without a nutcracker, you know that chitin is pretty tough and pretty durable material. It's also pretty indigestible. Very few organisms have enzymes that can break the chitin down. Once again, the ones that can do that are fungi, certain bacteria, and certain protists but not much else. So if you happen to have some shrimp and somebody didn't take all the shell off the shrimp, that's going to go through your digestive tract pretty much untouched. It comes out the other end the next day pretty much intact. There are very few, um, as far as I know, I don't think there's any animals that actually have symbiotic chitin digesting bacteria in them. They just crunch the shells up instead and pass it out the other way. But there are some microorganisms. Those are about the only ones that have the chitinases, the enzymes that break chitin down. Okay, so those are examples of simple polysaccharides. Three of them made of glucose alone, and then this other one, the chitin that's actually made of an amino, amino sugar version of glucose. 
So those are our simple polysaccharides.